Hello there. You're tuning to 7 Edition with me, Otto Othman. The headlines. Grayson caught with 1.3 million ringgit worth of diamonds at Chennai Airport. Introduction of other forms of calligraphy in schools to be considered. And over 30 dead in mass shootings across two U.S. states. A Malaysian man was arrested at Chennai International Airport on Sunday, Saturday after attempting to smuggle diamonds worth 22.5 million rupees or 1.34 million ringgit into India. Officials of India's Air Intelligence Unit, AIU, questioned the 48-year-old man after he arrived from Kuala Lumpur and recovered many bundles of diamonds from his luggage. In a statement, the AIU said they acted on a tip-off that precious stones were likely to be smuggled from Malaysia. Two white packets were also found in his inner wear and eight inside a cooker in his checked-in luggage. The 10 bundles contained 55 white mini Ziploc packets in which the diamonds were hidden. The passenger told Indian customs authorities that he was supposed to deliver the diamonds to a person outside the airport. However, no one turned up to collect the consignment when he was taken outside the airport and watched by police from a distance. Malaysian's Consul General in Chennai, Saravaran Karathihayan, said Indian police are further investigating the matter. Now, teaching other forms of calligraphy from other cultures in schools apart from Kat, which is a form of Malay Arabic calligraphy, can be considered. Education Minister Dr. Masli Male, who said this today, noted that he welcomed the suggestion proposed by Chinese association leaders that all schools learn about the calligraphic arts of the various paces. According to the minister, the idea will be discussed in details in the context of calligraphy as an art form. Uh, itu menarik untuk diperbincangkan, memandangkan di dalam pendidikan seni pun kita uh, menitik beratkan uh, kesenian daripada pelbagai kebudayaan, daripada pelbagai uh, etnik di, di dalam uh, Malaysia. Masli spoke to the media after the Prime Minister Debate Cup finals in Kuala Lumpur this morning. He also noted that he had a discussion with editors of Chinese dailies today to explain them in detail the ministry's plan to introduce khat in schools and gave his assurance that the move will not burden both teachers and students. So far, the ministry's proposal to introduce khat or jawi writing in the school curriculum have received mixed reactions. Despite this, the government said that the introduction of khat in Basim Layu subject will be implemented next year as scheduled. The National Union of the Teaching Profession, NUTP, today called for the abolition of the Yujian Pencapaian Sekolah Rendah, UPSR, taken by six, year six students. In a statement, the union said the exam is unnecessary and adds more pressure on students. According to its Secretary General, Harry Tan, abolishing the UPSR will reduce the stress on students and change public perception that A is a benchmark to gauge the quality of a student. He, however, said that doing away with the examination did not mean that students will not be evaluated, especially when it comes to securing a spot at a boarding school. He added that they can be assessed through tests set by their respective schools instead of a nationwide examination. Tan also said that the NUTP was prepared to assist the Education Ministry in improving the mechanism for graduating students. UPSR was introduced 33 years ago to replace the Standard 5 assessment. The union was in favor of doing away with the examination when the plan was first announced in 2016. The then education minister had said a decision would be made the following year, but until today, the ministry has remained silent on the matter. The Sarawak government has paid back 350 million ringgit to Putrajaya, which is the first phase of its 1 billion ringgit repayment of loans owed to the federal government. Its Chief Minister, Dr. Abang Johari Tun Openg, said that now it's time for the federal government to fulfill what it had promised, which is to repair and rebuild dilapidated schools in the state. Dr. Abang Johari said this as the state government has settled the first of four legal mechanisms set by the Putrajaya and agreed to by the state government. 
Christian degree. Priorito Uber Celeste. The next is, I want them to implement because the money has been given 350 million. If you say give, then I do. Now I have given, you must do it. Finance Minister Lim Guan Eng had recently said that the federal government was ready to disperse 350 million ringgit to the Sarawak government to repair dilapidated schools in the state, but only after the latter paid back the same amount first. Lim also said with the repayment of the 1 billion ringgit loan, the Sarawak government still owed Putrajaya 1.352 billion ringgit. The Johor Menteri Besar, Dato' Dr. Sahruddin Jamal, today apologised for the continued pollution in the Pasir Gudang district that has jeopardised the health of locals there. The State Health, Environment and Agriculture Committee chairman gave his word to improve weaknesses that have caused the health crisis to prolong since March. Ketika pencemaran udara yang berlaku pada 20 Jun lalu, kami di peringkat kerajaan negeri mengambil pelbagai langkah-langkah keselamatan dan pencegahan bagi memastikan semua penduduk terjejas mendapat pembelaan sewajarnya dan keselamatan serta kesihatan para pelajar terjamin. Bagaimanapun saya akui, mungkin ada beberapa perkara yang mungkin boleh diperbaiki dan sebagai Ketua Negeri, saya dengan rendah diri memohon maaf kepada keluarga Pasir Gudang dan berjanji kami semua akan berusaha untuk memperbaiki segala kelemahan yang ada di sini. At a town hall meeting on the air pollution in Pasir Gudang this morning, the Menteri Besar also said the state government was better prepared to deal with the most recent air pollution in June by taking preventive measures against a bigger disaster. He also asked the residents to stop the blame game and pleaded for time to fix the pollution problem. Elsewhere in Pahang, eight policemen were rushed to the Betong Hospital for treatment after showing symptoms of chemical poisoning. Now, this occurred when they were investigating the 15 suspicious black barrels which was found dumped at an oil palm plantation in Kara on Thursday. Health Minister Dato Sri Dr Zulkifli Ahmad said four of the policemen were still warded for 48 hours at the hospital for observation and added that the barrels were believed to contain solid sodium cyanide. Itu pun kita tidak boleh uh, presume uh, kalau disebutkan tadi kalau cyanide itu it, 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 bahaya muntah itu adalah satu simptom yang awal tetapi kalau kalau cyanide itu as a massive uh, poisoning dia uh, simptom itu aja jauh lebih parah jadi ini kalau sekadar itu uh, kalau dia buat biasa non in ICU uh, no need for antidote and apa ni cyanide semua itu saya rasa mereka itu uh, di luar uh, immediate uh, danger to life ya yeah? uh, mereka di observe di pantau yeah, until at least 24 hours, yeah. Dr. Sri Zulkifli also said the policemen were reported to be in stable condition, including four others who received outpatient treatment at the Kara Health Clinic. It was reported recently the chemicals in the barrels were in a solid state and could have been used to mine for gold. Although no presence of cyanide was detected in the air, the chemicals would emit gas if it reacts with water. Authorities are still investigating the origin of the materials, including inspecting the gold mines nearby the area. In Pera, a burst tire is believed to be the cause of an accident involving an ambulance at the North-South Expressway earlier today, which caused the death of its driver and a female patient it was transporting. The incident occurred in Ipoh at about 6.40 a.m. when the vehicle was on its way to Slim River. It was reported that the tire burst caused the ambulance to skid before it slammed into the side railing of the highway and overturned. 37-year-old Muhammad Hafiz Muhammad Bahari and the patient Aziza Dola, aged 66, from Sungkai, were killed on the spot. Their bodies were handed over to the police while the injured victims, a doctor, a nurse and the driver's assistant, were taken to the Slim River Hospital for treatment. When we return, horrifying lift incident in Istanbul. Stay with us.
Thank you for staying with us. Now, the United States have been rattled by two mass shootings that occurred in under just 24 hours over the weekend, killing a total of 30 people. The first in Texas, a gunman armed with an assault rifle, killed at least 20 people on Saturday when he opened fire on shoppers at a packed Walmart store. A suspect, 22-year-old Patrick Crucius from Allen, described by investigators as a loner, was then arrested and many face hate crime and capital murder charges. Authorities are currently studying an extremist manifesto that he posted online barely two hours before starting on the deadly rampage. My colleague Shafika Razali has the details. Thank you, Otto. Now, police say the document, which was uploaded and written by the white male suspect, has a nexus to a hate crime. The document was shared on 8chan, an online forum that usually features racist content and where users can post anonymously. Now, it was saved as a PDF format and in it, the suspect described Hispanic people in Texas and described a planned gun attack towards Hispanic invasion in Texas, motivated by white nationalist ideologies. Now, Otto, its author described a hatred of hate, uh, race mixing as well, and he suggested that the U.S. be divided into territories for different races. Um, he also included references uh, to the Christchurch mass shooting in New Zealand early March this year that left at least 51 people dead. Now, Cruz's Twitter account, which has been shut down since the attack, has been praising U.S. President Donald Trump and his efforts to build a wall at the Mexico-U.S. border. The president has since condemned the attack, calling the act a, an act of cowardice. Now, Saturday's attack was the second deadly shooting in less than a week in California after a disgruntled Walmart employee killed two co-workers on July 30th. CCTV images broadcast on U.S. media show Crucius in a dark T-shirt wearing ear protectors and brandishing an assault-style rifle. Police say a report of an active shooter was received at 10.40 a.m. local time at the time when the Walmart was full of shoppers buying back-to-school supplies. The victim, including 26 who were injured, were of various ages and sources say blood donations are needed to treat them. Meanwhile, uh, three Mexicans were among the 20 deceased. While the cops investigate, the FBI has opened a domestic terrorism investigation into the mass shooting. And that's all for me, Otto. Back to you in the studio. Now, 10 people were gunned down in another mass shooting just hours later in Dayton, Ohio, on Sunday. Those killed included the shooter after officers on patrol quickly responded to the incident and managed to shoot down the suspect. Dayton Daily News reported that the shooting began at about 1 a.m. local time at the Oregon district of the city when the man was refused entry to Ned Pepper's bar. At least 16 others were brought to hospital with sustained injuries. Police are currently working to identify the shooter and the FBI are on scene to provide any necessary assistance. Dayton Police Department wrote in a Twitter statement that they have appealed for witnesses to come forward to assist the probe into the incident. Thank you, Shafika, for those insights. Now, Hong Kong police have arrested more than 20 people late on Saturday after pro-democracy protesters defied Chinese authorities with another two major rallies that kicked off yesterday. The last fortnight has seen a surge in violence on both sides, with police repeatedly firing rubber bullets and tear gas to disperse increasingly hostile crowds. Two simultaneous marches were planned in the afternoon, as well as a city-wide strike on Monday, making further clashes all but inevitable. One of today's marches will try to end in a park near the liaison office, the department that represents China's central government in the semi-autonomous hub. Hong Kong has seen two months of protests and clashes triggered by opposition to a planned extradition law that quickly evolved into a wider movement for democratic reforms. After the break, now you can go green and beyond while commuting. Details next.
It's time for Future Now, where we take a peek at the world of tomorrow today. Many are not aware that even short-distance travel, especially by car, motorcycle, or bus, can still leave a huge carbon footprint. However, micromobility can be a more green and efficient alternative that can lessen the harmful impact on our planet. Trike, a homegrown company, on the other hand, is aiming beyond just eco-friendly commuting by paving the way for the future of urban mobility in Malaysia. Zansha Rahizad finds out how the company plans to roll out its vision of micro-mobility in the country. I'd like to apologize for the technical error. Now let's move on. It's time for car culture. Now there's a new resident in the premium B segment hatchback arena in Malaysia in the form of the 2019 Yaris, probably one of Toyota's most significant models. Now let's see what Sabrina Zainal has to say about it after she took it out for a spin. Today we get to check out the 2019 Toyota Yaris. So as you can see, I've got all my stuff here because we are going to test out how roomy it is because uh, apparently having a lot of space is something that uh, the, Gen y, uh, the Gen Y and the Millennials want. Uh, and according to Toyota, they've got the space that we need. So we are going to test it out. Uh, I am going to Gunting with my friends and I'm going to uh, go hiking and play the guitar as well. So that's why I've got all this stuff. Let's get started. managed to fit in quite a lot of stuff surprisingly uh, we've got the guitar my uh, hiking bag my other bag my gym bag two pairs of shoes an emergency kit uh, and one medium-sized luggage and one small luggage so I can say yeah we, it's got a lot of stuff and um, if you are like me you tend to store all your belongings in your car this is the car for you so now we are going to see how agile this car is, how it performs. So let's take it out for a spin. The 2019 Yaris is powered by um, a 1.5 liter VBTI engine that outputs 107 PS and 140 newton meters of torque. That's the same as the Toyota Vios, but we are not going to focus so much on the performance today of this car because I really think this car is meant for uh, city folks, um, people who are driving or are living in the cities, they have uh, they want a car that can maneuver well, um, handle well in you know, tight spaces, narrow spaces. So we're gonna look at that. The engine in this car is one of the most reliable and is paired to a CVT automatic gearbox with seven virtual ratios. In everyday driving scenarios and especially within city limits, the engine gearbox marriage of the new Yaris goes about doing business without any hiccups. Now, one of the most crucial factors when buying a new car is its exterior design. To me, the Yaris does pretty well on this point because it looks sporty and trendy with its bold-looking front splitter, side skirts, rear bumper extensions, and its unique rear roof spoiler. All variants are also adequately equipped with the necessary active and passive safety features. Unlike the Honda Jazz, um the 2019 Yaris is actually rated um, a five star for the ASEAN NCAP safety rating, which is the maximum you can get. Um, so it has a lot of safety features, uh, including the 360 degree camera, which the Honda Jazz doesn't have. And that's probably my favorite um, feature. Uh, it also has seven airbags and a blind spot monitoring um, and vehicle stability control, among others. Uh, 
in terms of agility, um, it's doing pretty well. Um, it's supposed to do well at corners and in when you're maneuvering, and I think that's because of the um, McPherson um, suspension system as well as the stabilizing bars. So, you know, everything put together, it's a well-sorted car that helps you um, maneuver well, handle well. Um, you don't get so much of a body roll, to be honest, uh, at corners. So I like that about this car. The 2019 Yaris that I got to test drive is the top G-Spec, which further adds on rear disc brakes, chrome outer door handles, and Optitron meter panel with 4.3-inch TFT multi-info display. It also comes with leather on the steering and gear knob, MID steering buttons, and six speakers. It seems like the Honda Jazz is quite popular, and I'm actually not sure why, because if you're talking about like um, spaciousness, uh, the Yaris would definitely win in that department because you've got ample leg room for the front passengers, uh, a lot of headroom as well, and um, the back seats are actually really, really spacious. I got to try the back seats earlier and I've got, I would get a lot of headroom, plus the seats are slanted, they're not straight like in the Jazz, so when they're slanted they're much more comfortable and uh, definitely that would be a win for the Yaris. Um, okay, another thing I want to highlight as well is the soundproofing. Toyota has actually made additional improvements in soundproofing in the Yaris, and again, that beats the Jazz in that department. With the Yaris price ranging between 70,888 to 83,888 ringgit, this guy represents a great value for money deal, especially when you compare it to its rivals like the Honda Jazz. Sabrina Zainal for 7 Edition. French inventor Frankie Zapata has made the first ever successful crossing over the English Channel on a jet-powered flyboard powered by a kerosene-filled backpack. The flying Frenchman took off from Sangate near Calais on Sunday and landed in St. Margaret's Bay in Do Dover. Footage of his 22-minute journey wraps up 7 edition this time round. I'm Ontwathman. Thanks for watching and have a good night.